Good afternoon. My name is Robert Dijkraaf. I'm director of the Institute and Leon Levy professor. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, ST Lee lecture uh, today here at the Institute for Advanced Study. And as always, at the end of the lecture, there will be a question and answer period followed by a reception in the common room in Fult Hall to which all of you are warmly invited. Now, to uh, give a particular warm word of honor to this very rich collection of ministers, ambassadors, and high representatives that are gathered here together. Uh, I'm very happy that you're wearing all your medals today. <laughs> um, but it's terrific to have this occasion to uh, 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 highlight the, uh, the importance that the Institute has given through its uh, uh, period to international affairs. And that there are many highlights there. Uh, for instance, uh, the branch of the League of Nations actually was uh, hosted here in Fult Hall during the Second World War. And of course, also, uh, we had the terrific pres presence of George Kennan. So I'm sure that some of you might have read with more than average interest his recently published diaries. I just want to quote you one little part of it. It's actually an, a remark he made on July 28, 1957. Um, I worry about my utter lack of enthusiasm for the wreath lectures that he was supposed to give. Christopher, his eight-year-old son, just asked me what I was interested in. I couldn't answer him. What indeed? Boats, I said vaguely. And I added that I would be interested in growing things, if life permitted. Plainly, the one thing I'm not interested in is what everybody expects me to be following most passionately, international affairs. And why not? It has been taken out of me. The frustrations and disillusionments have accumulated in such a number that I have only pessimism left. And I'm too healthy to be interested in what I'm pessimistic about. To be fully honest, I should give these lectures on why there is no hope in international affairs. <laughs> so in that cheerful spirit, we gather here together. And uh, I just want to recognize the three elements, I think, that are absolutely crucial to make this lecture possible. First of all, of course, a very distinguished speaker, which we have in the form of the Honorable Gareth Evans, and it will just be, in a moment, will be introduced at greater length. Second, what we need is some generous support, and that actually comes in the form of the Dr. S.D. Lee Fund for Historical Studies, which supports symposia, workshops, and associated public lecture like this, to provide a forum for the exchange of ideas between the different disciplines represented within the School of Historical Studies at the Institute enables us to bring leading scholars to the Institute to engage in discussions in area where exciting progress is being made. And I think actually it's a wonderful representation of this process here today. So as a little background, as deputy chairman of the Lee Foundation, Dr. S.T. Lee is a well-known philanthropist in Singapore who established the endowment at the Institute in 2007 and added to it recently uh, with his gift to the campaign for the Institute. He is the director of the family's league group of companies, a Singapore-based conglomerate of firms in industries that include rubber, pineapple, banking, and investment. And you know, his generosity is warmly appreciated. Now, the third element is a powerful and charming convener. And that we actually have in the form of Michael van Wald van Praag, who is in the middle of his tenure here as visiting professor of modern international relations and international law in the School of Historical Studies. And without... Uh, his efforts, this, uh, I'm sure that, uh, that we wouldn't have uh, this, this wonderful lecture that we are about to receive. So, in the full spirit of Russian dolls, I now give the word to Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's really a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Honorable Gareth Evans, uh, whom I met for the first time about 20 years ago, and whose work I've followed ever since. An optimist, as opposed to the quote that we just heard from George Kennan, um, and a man uh, who is truly uh, a senior statement, uh, statesman in the best sense of that word but also a scholar and an activist in the best sense of those words. Gareth Evans is a man of tremendous experience in the field of international affairs, who combines insight with brilliance, 
with action to address some of the major and most complicated challenges that we face today. Professor Evans has led a very varied life. He's currently Chancellor of the Australian National University, and until very recently he co-chaired the International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. From 2000 to 2009, he was the President and CEO of the International Crisis Group, an independent non-governmental organization created to prevent and resolve deadly conflict. He joined that organization after spending 21 years in Australian politics, 13 of them as cabinet minister, and from 1988 to 1996 as the foreign minister of Australia. Gareth Evans has published and continues to publish books, articles, opinion pieces on foreign relations, on human rights, on legal and constitutional reform, a number of which have earned him prizes. Of course, the one that stands out in relation to the topic of today's lecture is his book, Responsibility to Protect, Ending Mass Atrocity Crimes Once and for All, which was published in 2008 by the Brookings Institution Press and since then in paperback as well. During his term as Australia's longest serving foreign minister, he gained international praise for his role in developing the UN peace plan for Cambodia, for which he won the Anzac Peace Prize of 1994. He was similarly recognized for his roles in the realization of the International Chemical Weapons Convention and the founding of both the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, or the APEC Forum, and the ASEAN Regional Forum. He also served the United Nations as a member of the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on threats, challenges, and change, and on the Secretary General's Advisory Committee on Genocide Prevention. I invited Gareth Evans to speak to us because he is one of the leading architects of the responsibility to protect principle and one of its foremost global advocates, a monumental task for which, again, he's been widely recognized not least with the prestigious Four Freedoms Award, that of for the Freedom from Fear in 2010. And in 2011, Foreign Policy magazine cited him as one of the top 100 global thinkers, and I quote, for making the responsibility to protect more than academic. I invited him today for this important ST Lee lecture because we're in the midst of major political events and humanitarian tragedies in many parts of the world. Syria, the Central African Republic, and the Ukraine being only the most obvious and on the front pages of our newspaper. Each situation in its own way severely challenges the international community's ability and commitment to implement this crucial principle, the responsibility to protect and not to abuse it. Earlier today, uh, in the past few hours, we held a very productive meeting with a group of senior diplomats accredited to the United Nations, the UN Secretary General's first special advisor for the responsibility to protect, and other persons in the field of conflict resolution and related fields who are playing leading roles with respect to shaping and operationalizing the responsibility to protect principle, especially as it relates to the responsibility of the international community. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those distinguished guests for having come to this institute for the meeting and for this lecture. It's clear from the discussions that we've had that the challenges we face are very serious, but also that we have reason for optimism. And I now look forward to hearing the Honorable Gareth Evans' perspective and insights for which I've invited him and I want to invite him to take the floor. And before you do, Gareth, let me thank you in particular for accepting the invitation to meet with us earlier today and to speak here at this lecture and in particular for taking the trouble to make this long journey from Australia specifically for this purpose. Thank you, Gareth. <laughs> 
I give you the floor. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much, Michael, for that very generous, indeed rather over-the-top introduction of the finest American tradition. But uh, I'm deeply grateful, deeply appreciate the honour and privilege of being here at Princeton and having the opportunity to talk to you this evening. As the Institute director intimated in his introduction, being an optimist about international relations is a hazardous trade. The world does keep on letting you down. One might have thought, for example, that with the Cold War, age of realpolitik long behind us, crude territorial drabs, uh, grabs for, backed by the assertion of military power based on spurious claims to be protecting one's own language speakers and in defiance of every principle of the international playbook would be unthinkable. But Russia's behaviour in Ukraine has shown us that any such confidence is wholly misplaced. One might again have thought it inconceivable, not least with the air in East Asia now crackling with tension as it is, that anyone in Japan could be indifferent enough to the evidence of history and insensitive and provocative enough to suggest to its neighbours that it had nothing for which to apologise in its waging of aggressive war and perpetration of wartime atrocities in the past. But Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and his colleagues in government have done just that, with their questioning yet again, very recently, of national responsibility for the enslavement of comfort women and their recent visits to the Yasukuni Shrine, nurturing as that shrine does the souls of war criminals and harbouring in its grounds as it does the Yushikan Museum, which defends and glorifies Japan's military behaviour in the 1930s and 40s. And to take just one other example, the most harrowing, I think, of all, and the one that really goes to the heart of what this lecture this evening is about, one might have optimistically thought that we might really at last be on our way to ridding the world once and for all of mass atrocity crimes after the UN Security Council authorised the use of military force to protect civilians as we can all remember from threatened massacre in Libya in 2011, acting in specific reliance on the new principle of responsibility to protect, and in a way that if it had been matched for speed and decisiveness 20 years ago, would have saved the lives, I think we can acknowledge, of 8,000 men and boys in Srebrenica and saved the lives of 800,000 people, up to 800,000 in Rwanda. But now we have to ask ourselves whether or not that piece of optimism has not also been completely misconceived as we look out at the shame and the horror of Syria, with 130,000 or so dead after nearly three years of conflict, with half the country's population displaced within and beyond its borders, many of them in dire humanitarian need, and with atrocity crimes, some now from the rebel side certainly, but still overwhelmingly from the governing regime, almost a daily occurrence. The story I want to tell you about the emergence and evolution of the responsibility to protect principle is not a uniformly happy one. It grew out of despair. It generated hope. It produced, with Libya, a moment of real exhilaration. In the aftermath of Syria, however, it's led to a real sense of disappointment. But the story of the responsibility to protect, or R2P as it's now for better or worse commonly abbreviated, is not one of a return to despair. For a series of reasons that I'll spell out, there are strong grounds for optimism, for continuing to hope that when it comes to mass atrocity crimes, we will not be condemned forever to be repeating the cry never again. But let me begin at the beginning. To understand how important an innovation the new Responsibility to Protect Doctrine has been, we need to understand a little bit about where we were before it was born and to evaluate how serious a setback to the consolidation and evolution of the new norm that, uh, that Syria has been, we need to be very clear about what precisely were R2P's intended scope and limits. 
The emergence of the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine was a response to a very real and very age-old international problem, the continuing inability of us in the international community to effectively prevent or to halt mass atrocity crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, major war crimes, crimes against humanity, occurring behind state borders. What in some ways is hardest to believe how little changed in the decades after World War II. One might have thought that Hitler's atrocities within Germany and in the states under Nazi occupation would have laid to rest once and for all the notion, which had been predominant in international law and practice since the emergence of modern states, nation states back in the 17th century. One might have thought we'd put to rest the notion that what happens within state borders is nobody else's business. Or to put it more starkly that Sovereignty is essentially a license to kill. But even with all the developments in international human rights law and international humanitarian law, which followed the Second World War, even with the Nuremberg Tribunal Charter and its recognition of crimes against humanity, which could be committed by a government against its own people, even with the recognition of individual and group rights in the UN Charter and more grandly in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the subsequent international covenants, even with the new Geneva con Conventions taking forward international humanitarian law on the protection of civilians, and even after the Genocide Convention itself, signed in 1948, aimed at preventing and punishing the worst of all crimes against humanity, attempting to destroy whole groups simply on the base of their race or ethnicity or religion or nationality, even despite all of those new instruments, all that new international activity, the killing still went on. Why didn't things fundamentally change? Essentially, I think, because the overwhelming preoccupation of those who founded the UN was not, in fact, human rights, but the problem of states waging aggressive war against each other. What actually captured the mood of the time, and that which prevailed right through the Cold War years, was more than any of the human rights instruments I've mentioned. Article 27 of the UN Charter, quote, nothing should authorize intervention in matters essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. Of course, what is within the domestic jurisdiction, that begs the question, but the way it's been construed is a charter provision against intervention. So, the state of mind that even massive atrocity crimes like those of the Cambodian killing fields in the mid 70s were just not the rest of the world's business was dominant throughout the UN's first half century. Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia in 1978, which stopped the Khmer Rouge in its tracks, was universally attacked as a violation of state sovereignty, not applauded. Tanzania had to justify its overthrow of Uganda's Idi Amin in 1979 by invoking self-defense, not any larger human rights justification. And the same had been true of India's intervention in East Pakistan in 1971. With the arrival of the 1990s and the end of the Cold War, the prevailing complacent assumptions about non-intervention did come under challenge as never before. The quintessential peace and security problem of the 1990s, at least before 9-11 came along to change the focus to terrorism, the quintessential problem through the 90s became not interstate war, but rather civil war and internal violence perpetrated on a massive scale. With the breakup of various Cold War state structures, the removal of some superpower constraints, Conscience-shocking situations, as you'll all remember, repeatedly arose, above all in the former Yugoslavia and in Africa. But old habits of non-intervention died very hard. Even when situations cried out for some kind of response and the international community did react through the UN, it was too often erratically, incompletely, or counterproductively. As in the debacle of Somalia in 1993, the catastrophe of the Rwandan genocide in 94, and then the almost unbelievable default in Srebrenica in Bosnia just a year later in 95. Then the killing and the ethnic cleansing, you'll remember, started all over again in Kosovo in 99. Not everyone, but certainly most people and most governments accepted quite rapidly that external military intervention was the only way to stop it. 
But again, the Security Council failed to act, this time in the face of a threatened veto by Russia, an unhappily familiar story again over the last three years in the context of Syria, as I'll come back to later. The action that needed to be taken in Kosovo was eventually taken by a coalition of the willing, but without the authority of the Security Council and challenging, as a result, the integrity of the whole international security system, just as did the invasion four years later of Iraq, albeit in far less defensible circumstances. There was at least real debate about the issues in the 1990s, but it was fierce, doctrinal, and essentially ideological argument, producing nothing remotely resembling international consensus. On the one hand, there were advocates, mostly in the global north, of humanitarian intervention. The doctrine that there was a right to intervene militarily against the will of the government of the country in question in these cases. Droit d'ingérence, in the words of Bernard Kouchner, its primary advocate, later French foreign minister. On the other hand, of course, there were defenders of the traditional prerogatives of state sovereignty, who made the familiar case that internal events were none of the rest of the world's business, however horrifying they might be. It was unhappily very much a north-south debate, with the many new states born out of decolonization being very proud of their new one sovereignty, very conscious of their fragility, all too conscious of the way in which many of them had been on the receiving end in the past of not very benign interventions from the imperial the colonial powers and not very keen to acknowledge their right to do so again, whatever the circumstances. Hardly anyone talked about prevention, hardly anyone talked about less extreme forms of engagement and intervention. There was no, than military intervention, there was no system of international criminal justice to which anyone could resort. The options were send in the Marines or do nothing. This was the environment which led Kofi Annan to issue a Secretary General. He's now quite famous challenge to the General Assembly in the millennium year 2000. And what he said was this, if humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations of human rights that offend every precept of our common humanity? Well, it was in answer to that challenge and to try to build a new international political consensus that the Canadian government sponsored the International Commission on Intervention in State Sovereignty in 2001, which I co-chaired with a very distinguished African diplomat, Mohamed Sanoun, as my co-chair, which did have a really all-star international cast, including former US Congressman Lee Hamilton, uh, Philippines' Fidel Ramos, Canada's Michael Ignatieff, and Russia's Vladimir Lukin, for that matter, along with several others. And it was this commission which came up with the concept of responsibility to protect. As subsequently refined and endorsed by the UN General Assembly, which I'll come to in a second, the new doctrine, as we spelt it out, really had three key dimensions. <coughs> First of all, it's language, which recharacterized the issue. Not about the right of big states to throw their weight around militarily, but rather the responsibility of all states to protect their own and other peoples from mass atrocity crimes. So the right to intervene became the responsibility to protect, a very important linguistic shift. Second thing we did was to conceptually spread the responsibility. Every state, we said, had the responsibility to protect its own people. Other states had a responsibility to assist them to do so. And if a state was manifestly failing as a result of either incapacity or ill will to protect its own people, then the wider international community itself had a responsibility to act more decisively. And the third thing we did, I think very importantly, was to broaden the scope of appropriate responses. Whereas humanitarian intervention, which the whole debate in the 90s had been about, focused just one dimensionally on military reaction, responsibility to protect concept involves multiple elements across the whole response spectrum, starting with preventive action, both long-term, short-term, 
reaction, yes, certainly, when prevention fails. But then, after the crisis is over, post-crisis rebuilding, aimed again at preventing the recurrence of whatever it is that went catastrophically wrong. The reaction element in the middle, moreover, was itself crafted as a nuanced continuum, beginning with persuasion, moving from there to non-military forms of coercion of varying degrees of intensity, like sanctions or threats of international criminal prosecution, and then only as an absolute last resort, contemplating coercive military force. Articulated this way, this new concept, RTP, did gain remarkable international traction within a very short time, and in fact, has had one of the fastest take-ups ever of any new idea to emerge in the global arena. Although its initial impact, the initial impact of our report was rather dulled uh, by the fact that it came out very shortly after 9-11, which took the air, as I've already said, out of every international debate on anything than terrorism, the supporters of the new concept ground away at it, and after two further reports, one by the high-level panel that Michael mentioned, another by Kofi Annan himself, R2P, the concept of the responsibility to protect, won unanimous endorsement by more than 150 heads of state and government meeting as the UN General Assembly at the 2005 World Summit on the 60th anniversary of the UN. The language of the General Assembly resolution described the reach of the concept in terms of what are now universally regarded as the four crimes, namely genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, and three pillars. Pillar one being the responsibility, again, of each state to protect its own population from these crimes. Pillar two being the responsibility of others in the international community to assist a state to do so. And pillar three being the responsibility of the wider international community to respond in timely and decisive manner, that's the language used, and by all appropriate means, not excluding coercive action in accordance, if it's done in accordance with the UN Charter, if this becomes necessary because the state in question is, quote, manifestly failing to protect its own people. So the whole thing laid out in that way. The period from 2005 to 2011 saw the gradual growth to maturity of what I think can be described as the new norm of responsibility to protect. Conceptual arguments, and there were many of them, as to the precise scope and limits of the new norm were largely resolved with the help, I must say, of an excellent series of Secretary General's reports written by his then special advisor on R2P, Ed Luck, who's with us here in the audience this evening. Rear guard, political resistance to it, after being initially quite strong, a lot of buyer's remorse around in the immediate aftermath of 2005, but that political resistance did steadily fall away, as evidenced, and I'll come back to this point later, in the successive annual UN General Assembly debates on those Secretary General's reports, which took place from 2009 onwards. New institutional mechanisms and processes to facilitate the application of the new doctrine gradually evolved, with a lot of attention being given by a number of national governments, international organisations in particular, to what preventive and early warning measures should look like. And it was increasingly being seen as not just a rhetorical device, but something that was actually going to be relevant in political practice. Most obviously and most importantly in this period in Kenya in early 2008, when you remember in the aftermath of a really catastrophic eruption of violence in the context of a contested election involving ethnic cleansing from the Rift Valley and church burning with people inside, all horribly reminiscent of Rwanda, when in that particular context, a diplomatic mission invoking responsibility to protect, led by Kofi Annan under the auspices of both the UN and the African Union, did successfully defuse what was rapidly deteriorating into a Rwandan-scale catastrophe. A number of other non-governmental organisations, including the New York-based Global Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, whose director Simon Adams is also here tonight, played an important part during this period and still do through their analysis and advocacy and workshops and conferences and training programs, important role in consolidating the understanding 
the conceptual scope of the new norm, promoting its effective implementation in practice, not least again at the crucial prevention stage. When, in 2011, the UN Security Council authorised military action explicitly under the Responsibility to Protect banner in the cases more or less simultaneously of Côte d'Ivoire and Libya, this was widely heralded as the coming of age of the new norm. Libya especially, at least at the outset, seemed to be a textbook example of exactly how responsibility to protect is supposed to work in practice. That's to say, at the reaction stage, if prevention strategies have, for whatever reason, failed. And in the case of Libya, they simply weren't applicable because the whole thing erupted so rapidly, you'll recall, in the context of the emerging Arab Spring. But at least at the reaction stage, in the face of a rapidly unfolding mass atrocity situation, the reaction in Libya was a textbook example. What you had was first a condemnatory and sanctions imposing resolution being passed unanimously by the Security Council. And this was then followed three weeks later when it seemed clear to everyone that new atrocities were imminent, particularly massacre in Benghazi along the coast. That was then followed by the authorization with no dissenting voices on the Security Council of military measures, quote, to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack. And acting under that authorization, as I've already said, and as you know, NATO-led forces took immediate action, and the feared massacres in Benghazi and elsewhere did not eventuate. But with the apparent maturity of responsibility to protect, also came a midlife crisis. As the days and the weeks went on in Libya, the Western-led intervention came under fierce attack particularly by the BRICS countries, so-called Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, all of whom were actually on the Security Council at the time, under attack for exceeding the mission's narrow civilian protection mandate and being content with nothing less than regime change, which was, of course, finally accomplished with the overthrow of Gaddafi in October that year. Unhappily, that criticism translated directly into Security Council paralysis in responding to what rapidly became the even more alarming situation in Syria. From mid-2011 all the way through until, I guess, September last year when the use of chemical weapons, the most extreme form of atrocity crime of all, did force the Security Council to act. The Security Council, during that whole crucial long, long period, could agree on almost nothing at all. Not only could it not agree on the extreme step of military force, as to which there were indeed plenty of good reasons not to act, but nor could they agree on any lesser coercive measures like targeted sanctions or an arms embargo or referral to the International Criminal Court, nor could they even agree on an outright robust condemnation of what was going on. The attitude seems to have been, coloured as it was by the Libyan experience, give the P3, the permanent three, UK, US, France, nothing, because if you give them anything, they'll take everything. The tensions that exploded in Syria in early 2011 were, of course, long in the making. They were never going to be easily containable. There was that extra dimension of real politic, Russia's engagement in the country, which wasn't present in Syria. In, in Libya, rather. But a major opportunity to break the cycle of violence, breeding new violence, was completely lost. Completely lost with the failure of the Security Council in mid-2011 to even, as I've said, condemn the behaviour of the Assad regime, let alone take more robust measures, when it first became obvious that unarmed protesters, and this was before the Civil War period, that unarmed protesters were being savagely attacked. And this did give the regime a whole new sense of untouchability and impunity, which led, of course, to further repressive behaviour, which energised a fight back by opposition forces, helped by military defection, some external support, which then spiralled very quickly into the full-scale civil war, which we've been watching with horror unfold ever since. To repeat, what was needed in 2011 was not a Security Council decision mandating the use of coercive military force. Syrian situation was then, 
has remained since very different from that in Libya. <coughs> the case for military intervention has always been very much harder to make. At every relevant stage, such action would almost certainly have resulted in more casualties, not less. <coughs> but the case for a condemnatory statement was absolutely overwhelming, and had that been supplemented by the kind of measures that were initially applied in Libya, sanctions and arms embargo, threat of criminal court prosecution, I think it's very clear that President Assad would have been given cause for pause. So what did go wrong? There is an obvious answer, even if it continues to be met with denial and resistance by those who most need to accept it. And that is the perception by the BRICS countries and many others in the developing world that the NATO-led intervention was about nothing more than the destruction of the Gaddafi regime, that it wasn't really about just civilian protection at all. There was no problem at all from the outset, it needs to be remembered, <coughs> with the quickly concluded military action in Cote d'Ivoire at around about the same time, um, creating again no problems at all. What the initial action, which was agreed to, if not with positive votes, certainly without, uh, without vetoes and just with abstentions, not negative votes. What was agreed to in Resolution 1973 of March uh, to apply all necessary measures to protect, as I've said, civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack, in agreeing to that, all the members of the Council knew exactly what they were doing. The NATO-led airborne forces did precisely what they were then expected to do. And as we've said, the immediately feared massacres in Benghazi and elsewhere didn't eventuate. <coughs> the real complaints related to the days and weeks and months that followed, when it became very evident from both their words and their deeds that the P3 would settle for nothing less than regime change and do whatever it took to achieve that. <coughs> the charge sheet in this respect includes the interveners rejecting ceasefire offers that may well have been serious and which certainly should at least have been explored, striking fleeing personnel that pose no immediate risk to civilians, striking locations that had no obvious military significance like the compound you may remember in which certain Gaddafi relatives were killed in the early stages, and more generally then supporting rather comprehensively, the rebel side in what did rapidly become a civil war, ignoring the very explicit arms embargo in the process. Now, of course, the P3, US, UK, France, have some answers, and quite strong answers to those criticisms. What they say is this, if civilians were to be protected, house by house, in areas like Tripoli that remained under Gaddafi's control, direct control, <coughs> how could that be done except by overturning the whole regime? <coughs> If one side was taken in a civil war, it's because one-sided regime killing sometimes does now lead, as it has in Syria, to civilians acquiring by one means or another the arms to fight back. A more limited monitor and swoop kind of concept of operations would, it was also argued, have led to a longer and messier conflict which would have been politically impossible to sustain in the US and Europe and likely, so the argument goes, to have produced many more civilian casualties. While those arguments do have force, the trouble remains that the P3, Permanent 3, resisted debate on them at any stage in the Security Council itself. And the other council members were never given sufficient information to enable those arguments to be properly evaluated. Now, maybe not all the BRICS countries are to be believed when they say that had better process been followed, more common ground could have been achieved. I think, as I've already said, Russia's position on Syria was from the outset manifestly realpolitik driven and it's not easy to see how the Russians would have behaved very differently. But I think all these countries, we have the Indian ambassador with us tonight, and I'm sure he can confirm this, all these countries can be believed when they say they feel bruised by the Permanent Three's dismissiveness during the Libyan campaign and that those bruises will simply have to heal before there'll be any prospect at all of consensus on tough responses to such hard situations in the future. So, two big questions now arise as to the future of the responsibility to protect in the light of these events and now some other things happening as well, creating new tensions within the Permanent Five. <coughs> 
Question one, has there been an irretrievable breakdown now in the Security Council as to how to react in the future to the hardest mass atrocity crime situations, such that consensus in the future is really unimaginable? Question two, more generally, has the whole responsibility to protect project that I've described to you, has the whole enterprise been seriously and perhaps irreversibly tarnished by the Libyan events in their aftermath? I believe the answers to both those questions are in the negative. I believe that Responsibility to Protect does indeed have a future. I believe that we are not headed back to the bad old days of the 1990s in this respect. So let me spend the remainder of this lecture giving you four big reasons why, and then you can come at my throat when I'm finished. <coughs> the first reason is that whatever the difficulties being experienced in the Security Council, the underlying norm is really in remarkably good shape in the wider international community. The best evidence of this, as I foreshadowed earlier, is in the annual debates on the responsibility to protect principle in the General Assembly, which continue to demonstrate <coughs> that even in the aftermath of these strong disagreements over Libya, there is still effectively universal consensus on basic R2P principles. No state is heard now to disagree that every sovereign state has the responsibility to the best of its ability to protect its own peoples from genocide, ethnic cleansing, other major crimes against humanity, war crimes. No state disagrees that other states have the responsibility to the best of their own ability to assist that state to do so. And no state really seriously continues to challenge the principle that the wider international community should respond with timely and decisive collective action when a state's manifestly failing to meet its responsibility to protect its own people. <coughs> certainly, certainly there is less general comfort with the last of those pillars than there is with the first two. And of course there will always be argument about what precise form action should take in a particular case. But the basic principles are really not under challenge. In the most recent annual General Assembly debate on responsibility to protect in September last year, in which 68 countries more than ever before participated, there was overwhelming support for all the principles as I've articulated. And that report, and that, sorry, that support was repeated two weeks later in many strong leaders' statements in the general debate which opened the new General Assembly session. Second ground for optimism, there has been a continued evolution of institutional preparedness at the national, the regional, the global level, which is absolutely crucial if responsibility to protect is to move beyond rhetoric to effective practical implementation, particularly at the crucial stages of early prevention and particularly at the crucial stage of early reaction to warning signs of impending human rights catastrophe. Particular attention is going into the creation of focal points, so-called, within governments, within intergovernmental organisations, namely high-level officials whose designated day job is to analyse mass atrocity risk situations and to work on developing preventive strategies and then to energise an appropriately swift and early response within their own systems. I have to say that the United States, with its Atrocities Prevention Board, is probably the best and clearest example of all of the development of such a national focal point within a national system, which is doing outstanding work in just these respects. We've had an initiative led by my own country, Australia, along with Costa Rica and Denmark and Ghana, who's represented through its High Commissioner here again tonight, um, to establish a global network of such focal points, which has already seen 38 states sign up. <coughs> the UN system has its own focal point with the Office of the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, attached to which is also, as I've said, a position of Special Advisor on Responsibility to Protect although that latter position, since Ed Luck left, is regrettably now very much a part-time one and not based in New York. That's needed to be supplemented within the UN by a more wholehearted institutional commitment to making responsibility protect work, especially in relation to prevention and early warning. 
But there are happily now some signs of that commitment being made with the Secretary General's recently announced Rights Upfront initiative late last year, which was itself largely a response to the UN's system's failure to act strongly and effectively in the face of the Sri Lankan catastrophe in 2009. And what's involved really is a focus on much stronger and more timely information flow within the UN system and from the UN to member states and better coordinated responses across the system. Reaction to that initiative from member states to date does seem to have been strongly positive, which does incidentally rather contest the notion still being advanced by some RTP critics that many states will never be sympathetic to the characterization of emerging human rights problems in RTP terms because of the slippery slide they argue this entails to ultimate military intervention. I don't think that's the case. I do think it's the case that people understand the importance of prevention, understand the importance of early warning, and recognize that that has to apply across the board if it's to work. The third reason for my optimism about the longer term future of RTP is that the Security Council itself, for all the obvious continuing neuralgia about the Libya intervention and the impact of that in turn on Syria, the Security Council, in fact, since March 2011 and since its decisions then on Cote d'Ivoire and Libya, has in fact endorsed 12 other resolutions directly referring to responsibility to protect, including measures to confront the threat of mass atrocities in Yemen, Libya, Mali, Sudan, South Sudan, Central African Republic, most recently in relation to the need for an effective humanitarian response in Syria. There were just four Security Council resolutions prior to Libyan events in 2011, using specific RTP language, there have been 12 since. While none of those 12 resolutions have actually authorised anything like a Libyan-style military intervention, together I think they do confirm that rumours of responsibility protects death in the Security Council have been greatly exaggerated. The kind of commitment that's been shown to supporting robust peacekeeping operations in Mali, the Central African Republic in particular, is very different, very different to the kind of indifference which characterised the Council's reaction in Rwanda and so many other cases before it. Moreover, I think it is worth remembering, again in the specific context of Syria, <coughs> that when the Security Council was confronted with unequivocal evidence of one specific mass atrocity crime, the chemical weapons attacks in Ghouta in August last year, consensual action on the Council did swiftly follow, authorising the destruction of the regime's chemical weapons and foreshadowing consideration of coercive action under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter should that cooperation not be forthcoming. True, 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 the decision was framed as a response to the proven use of an outlawed weapon of mass destruction rather than framed as a major war crime or crime against humanity breaching R2P principles, but what drove the decision was manifestly a unanimous sense of the total unconscionability in this day and age of this kind of indiscriminately inhumane action. The fourth and last argument for optimism I make about the future of R2P is that again for all the division and paralysis over Libya and Syria, it is possible to see at least the beginnings of a new dynamic in the Security Council that would enable the consensus that matters most, namely how to react in the hardest of cases, to be recreated in the future. The ice was broken in this respect by Brazil in late 2011 with its proposal that the idea be accepted of supplementing responsibility to protect, not replacing it, supplementing it, with a complementary set of principles and procedures which it labelled, would you believe, RWP, responsibility while protecting. There were two core elements of the Brazilian proposal. First, that there should be a set of prudential criteria fully debated and fully taken into account before the Security Council mandated any use of military force. And second, that there should be some kind of enhanced monitoring and review process which would enable such mandates to be seriously debated by all council members during their implementation phase with a view to ensuring, so far as possible, that consensus was maintained throughout the course of an operation. Manifestly not, of course, the case in Libya. 
While the response of the P3 to the Brazilian proposal has so far remained highly sceptical, uh, it has become really increasingly clear that if a breakthrough is going to be achieved, if unvetoed majorities are once again to be possible in the Council in support of Chapter 7 based military interventions in extreme cases, they're going to have to be more accommodating. US, UK, France are going to have to be more accommodating. The incentive to do so may be that there have been some intriguing signs in the so-called BRICS countries that the two of them that matter, I guess, most in this context because of their veto-wielding powers, China and Russia, that they might actually be interested in pursuing these ideas further. I attended a two-day meeting in Beijing last October, October 2013, hosted by the Foreign Ministry Think Tank, China Institute of International Studies, which brought together uh, specialist scholars and practitioners from China and the other BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India and South Africa, together with a handful of Western specialists. And at that meeting, quite strong support was expressed around the table for the principal, yet another acronym, RP, Responsible Protection, which had been floated uh, earlier by a Chinese scholar in a 2012 journal article, which specifically cited and built upon the Brazilian responsibility while protecting concept, and which evidently had been the subject, it was very clear around the table, had been the subject of an awful lot of discussion within the Chinese policy-making circles. And then in that same month, <coughs> a meeting that I didn't go to, but Simon Adams, I mentioned, went to, uh, in Russia, Diplomatic Academy of the Russian Foreign Ministry, apparently on the initiative of Foreign Minister Lavrov himself, hosted a one-day meeting on responsibility to protect, evidently the first of its kind, attended by senior ministry officials and Russian academics, a handful of Western specialists. And I'm told that while that meeting was rather less focused than the Beijing one had been, there was again much attention paid to the concept of responsibility while protecting and the Chinese responsible protection concept, and there was an emerging sense from the meeting that Russia needed to align itself with those views. Of course, now, a few months later, with the explosion of concern about Russia's behaviour, Russia's very cynical behaviour in Ukraine, combined, of course, with the scepticism that's bound to be generated in an R2P context by Moscow's claim now to be acting in Crimea to protect its Russian nationals and language speakers, albeit that, I hasten to add, we have not seen any crude reliance by Russia in Ukraine on R2P, quote unquote, as such, of the kind that we did see when it invaded Georgia in 2008. But we have to acknowledge that that distinction notwithstanding, that cynicism, is real, the scepticism is real, and the atmosphere in the Security Council may not exactly be very conducive in the immediately foreseeable future at least to winning consensus in any new big principles debate on anything to do with state sovereignty and the proper scope and limits of coercive intervention. But I still believe, I believe it's both highly desirable and possible over time, if not immediately, to initiate some serious discussion within the Council using informal processes in the first instance, which I very much hope that my own country, Australia, can play a part in initiating during its remaining period on the Council, some effort to put some detailed substance into the two elements that were highlighted in that original responsibility while protecting proposal and repeated in the Chinese formulation. The two elements, again, the first of them was systematic attention being paid to the relevant prudential criteria for any use of coercive military force. Such criteria have not yet been formally adopted in any UN resolution, in the Assembly, Security Council or anywhere else. But they were spelled out in the original Commission report that I co-chaired, which introduced the Responsibility to Protect concept more than a decade ago, and they've really been very much part of the currency of international debate ever since. Without going into detail about these criteria, there are essentially five of them. Seriousness of the harm involved, the intent, plausibly credible or not, of those who want to wield the power, the criterion of last resort, 
that nothing else than military action will do the job of protecting the people in question. Criterion of proportionality, that the force used is not excessive to the protection need concern. And the balance of consequences, that any use of force doesn't end up causing more harm than good. It would, I don't think, be necessary and it would probably be counterproductive to try to formally adopt these five criteria in a Security Council General Assembly resolution. Um, nor do I argue that even systematic attention to these benchmarks would produce consensus with any kind of push-button consistency in the future. Life is never that easy. But I do think there's plenty of reason to believe that if an understanding develops that those arguing a case for military intervention must in practice make a detailed and compelling case that all five of these criteria would be satisfied, I believe if that understanding develops, the chances of reaching consensus one way or the other will be significantly improved. The other element, you'll recall, proposed by the Brazilians for a new process would involve some kind of serious ongoing review of a coercive mandate once granted. That's likely, I know, to be met with some resistance by the P3 on the grounds that there does have to be some, fix, some flexibility in the implementation of any military mandate. Military operations can never be micromanaged. They are not unreasonable concerns, but equally, I don't think there's any reason in principle or practice why broad concepts of operations, as distinct from strategy, as distinct from tactics, should not be regularly debated. Why not debate the concept of operations? Why not question, as necessary, whether that concept is right at the beginning and still has utility as an enterprise proceeds? It's not necessarily a matter of establishing any new institutional mechanism, uh, although sunset clauses requiring formal renewal if a mission is to continue are hardly unfamiliar in the Security Council. It's really more a matter, again, of there being some real understanding that ongoing debate on mandate implementation is wholly legitimate. One other straw in the wind suggesting that there's at least some willingness within the P5 to move forward to find new consensus on responsibility to protect related issues is the French proposal floated first by the French President in the General Assembly, then in a major article by Foreign Minister Fabius, that the P5 members voluntarily agree to suspend their right to exercise a veto when exercising a vote on a mass atrocity crime situation, one that's reported to the Council and described as such by the Secretary General. Initial reactions from other P5 members so far have not been very encouraging. Perhaps the uh, problem is that they've taken to heart the nostrum very well articulated by an Australian Prime Minister back in the 1940s when he said that famously that, quote, the trouble with gentlemen's agreements is that there are not enough bloody gentlemen. But if ever the Security Council, if ever the Security Council is to win back some of the respect and credibility that both its structure and behaviour have increasingly denied it, it is going to have to be through informal adjustments of this kind. And it's very much to be hoped that the move for veto self-denial in atrocity case, crime cases will gather real traction. It's important to emphasise again, finally, that the disagreement that's now evident in the UN Security Council is really only about how the responsibility to protect norm is to be applied in the hardest, sharp-end cases. Those where prevention has manifestly failed, the harm to civilians being experienced or feared is so great that the issue of military force simply has to be given at least prima facie consideration. There is, of course, there continues to be much more to the R2P project than just these extreme late stage situations, as I hope I've made clear. And there is much to indicate that, that, that in its other dimensions, its preventive dimensions, its less extreme reactive dimensions, and its, in, in its rebuilding dimensions, that all these do continue to have wide international support. But of course, we focus on the hard cases. We focus on these ones raising prima facie the issue of military intervention because these are the talismanic cases. And if consensus has broken down irretrievably at the highest political level on how these cases should be handled, there is a danger 
a real danger of flow-on risk to the credibility of the whole R2P enterprise. And after all that's been achieved in this respect in the last decade, that really would be heartbreaking. It may be too big a call to say, as the British historian Martin Gilbert did a decade ago, that acceptance of the responsibility to protect principle is, quote, the most significant adjustment to sovereignty in 360 years. That's a big call. But it's certainly true to say, certainly true to say, that Responsibility Protect has gained worldwide normative traction in a way that was and remains inconceivable for the concept of humanitarian intervention, which R2P sought to displace. Congenital optimist that I am, I really do believe that policymakers now, right around the world, do understand the stakes much better than they used to. I do believe that no one really wants to see a return to the bad old days when appalling crimes against humanity committed behind sovereign state walls were seen by almost everyone as nobody else's business. I really do believe that the imperative for effective cooperation that our common humanity demands will eventually prevail. But if you think I have this wrong, you'll no doubt now take this opportunity to tell me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>